So welcome to the OCLC virtual town hall on libraries and the COVID-19 crisis. Um, greetings, I know everybody's still streaming into the room and joining us over at YouTube as well, um, but we're really excited to be with you today. Um, my name is Sharon Streams. I'm the director of the Web Junction program at OCLC. And I'd also like to um, introduce our panelists for today to include Ashley Cooksley, who is a school library media specialist, consultant, and an adjunct uh, instructor at the University of Central Arkansas. We have Kendra Jones, who's deputy director at Timberland Regional Library in Washington State. We have Lauren Presley, who's associate dean for research and learning services at the University of Washington Libraries, also in Washington State. My colleague, Kendra Morgan, who's Senior Program Manager at Web Junction, and also my colleague, Rachel Frick, who's Executive Director for the OCLC Research Library Partnership. And finally, we have Bobby Newman, who is a Writer and Consultant and Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine in the greater Midwest region. So thank you, panelists, for joining us here today. And I also want to welcome all of you. So for those of you who um, registered with WebEx in, in advance, um, here's a reflection of who all registered. We have um, a little over half who are coming from public libraries and just under a third from academic libraries. And then we have a whole smattering of community college, school libraries, special libraries, and uh, consortia, and uh, state, regional, and national agencies and organizations. So we're really excited to have a, a mix of, of library types represented here. And this is what we really hope that the conversation will reflect the whole varieties of input. So I think as uh, JP mentioned in her audio uh, introduction is, uh, as you could probably glean, this is going to be a very interactive session. Anybody who's come to a Web Junction webinar know that we typically don't just do a you know, a lecture for for 60 minutes. Instead, it's more of a conversation. And this is really going to be that. Our panelists are going to be contributing from their perspective, but we're going to have a lot of chat, some polls, and some questions for you. So uh, we really are interested in your participation. Um, for those who are able to do this and tweet simultaneously, uh, you first of all, you're amazing. Um, but uh, the hashtag is Hashtag OCLC COVID Town Hall that will help us track that conversation. Um, and we will be using for our polling, um, we will be using Poll Everywhere software. So um, I'm going to give you a moment to go open a, another browser window and go to pollev.com slash OCLC. That's the URL that's listed here on this slide. And then we are going to ask you, this is just kind of a warm up question just to see how this goes. And this is, where are you joining the session from today? Are you working from home? Are you working in your library or other place of work which is open to whoever it is that you serve or your place of work which is currently closed or something that doesn't fit any of those categories? And we can take up to 700 responses. Um, so if you, um, you know, get a, a message that says that uh, you couldn't respond, that's why. Yeah, so um, I think you are all like all of us <laughs> are for the most part, which is working from home. Um, and so I'm sure you have your various coworkers there with you of whether they're four-legged or two-legged. Yeah, okay. So we have just 1% thus far of a, of a library or other organization that's open. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that's really helpful to know. So good job. That worked out really well with the polling, and we're going to be um, using that just as we go through this event. Um, so this this event is is here as you know it's it's again we don't have answers of course none of us do but it's really for us to get together and share from our experiences 
And I also wanted to um, bring this message to you that our um, yeah. president and CEO here at OCLC uh, recorded for you for this event. And this is really helps to set the context of um, what our experience has been here at OCLC and um, what we are, are trying to do with this event today. So I will turn it over to Skip for this about three minute um, video. Good morning or afternoon, depending from where you're dialing in. I welcome all of you as we connect to share experiences and learn from one another. Sharing ideas and expertise is part of the DNA of libraries and librarians. It's an honor to serve you and facilitate sharing in this very important conversation. I'm grateful to our Web Junction and Research Library partnership teams for facilitating today. Because OCLC serves a global library community, I have been monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak since the start of the year when news was just starting to come out of China. We have acted early and extensively to protect the health and safety of our staff and our members across the world. This meant canceling conferences and meetings that we were so looking forward to, curtailing business travel, and then transitioning all of our offices to a work from home environment. We are hearing from many of you as your institutions go through these similar stages. There has been a five fold increase in access to Web Junction resources already. We know there are several surveys out there helping to gather information, and you've been contributing through local stories to our social media. Thank you for sharing those experiences. Like you, we are simultaneously reacting and adapting to the rapidly changing present while also looking toward and planning for the still unknown future and our collective new normal, whatever that may be. While this pandemic will certainly have long lasting impact to how we live and work, there are things we can do now. It has been heartening to read the many ways that libraries are adapting to serve their communities. We have also been adapting various services and content partnerships to help. A special COVID-19 page on our website has the details. We all know that now is the time to build on the strength of our collaborative networks among libraries. We'll need that more than ever going forward. This town hall is one example. Our mission at OCLC is this, what is known must be shared to make breakthroughs possible. We join you in sharing knowledge, the medical breakthroughs we need, the innovation, the development, it's all on the horizon. It's an honor to lead an organization like OCLC committed to the service and advancement of that knowledge. We are deeply grateful for the opportunity to serve you and your colleagues around the world, and also deeply grateful for the work you do in your communities. Our role today is to be here for you, our community. We understand that as suddenly isolated from your colleagues and your customers, that connection is more important than ever. We have this virtual room filled with hundreds of you gathered from across the miles and across all types of libraries. We are all gathered here today to share, to listen, and I hope you will leave this session feeling buoyed by the strong network of support that you have among your library peers and here at OCLC. Thank you, Skip. And now I'd like to turn it over to, uh, or bring our panelists, um, the first question that I'd like to ask is, I'm going to start with our, our library, um, our library workers with Kendra Jones at Timberland and Lauren Presley at University of Washington. And I just, and, and both of them are from Washington State, which we have been in a shelter in place for one month uh, already. And so I want to ask you, what is the status of your library services today? And how did those changes evolve? And how were the decisions made? So let's start with Kendra Jones. Hi, yes, this is Kendra. So the status of our library services today are that exempt staff are teleworking and providing all of the online services that have always been available, though they have certainly been bolstered um, thanks to, in part, to some of our vendors' generosity and because we have increased our budget in those ways. And we started, like maybe the first two weeks that we were here, uh, um, without everybody teleworking. So it really has evolved a lot to having maybe 10, 12 people doing all of that and now to having about 99 people assigned to either teleworking or what we're calling essential staff. So that would include our IT, our payroll, those are very important people, and our facility staff. Um, as far as what we provide to the public though, it really is all online services. We don't even actually have a phone service up and running right now. 
we are we did add a chat service from our website and we've mostly pivoted to focus our efforts on social media, virtual programs and services, which our staff have been doing a really amazing job um, of. And luckily we have a really good relationship with our, our union actually, and that has made things a lot easier for us. I know that that's not the case for everybody, but as a really large public library system, we're 27 libraries, we're very rural, it was important for that to be an easy transition because our main focus is of course, taking care of our staff and making sure they are safe as well as, well as our patrons. Um, the decisions were mostly made by our administrative team, which I am a part of. We, when appropriate and when we possible, we did bring in of course, more of our frontline staff and other management staff. Though when we first closed, it we did so sort of rapidly and the first two weeks not everybody was approved to telework so that was a little tricky and now more are so i would say that's really an overview i think of our stat our, our service now thanks kendra and just a reminder for all of that uh, kendra is in timberland uh, it's a public library uh, system so let's go to lauren to about the university library perspective. Thank you. Uh, we're entering week seven uh, this week, and at this point, our buildings are closed and we're offering services remotely. Our research and learning librarians are offering virtual reference and consultation services, asynchronous and synchronous online instruction and workshops, and continue to engage with their departments. Catalogers and others have taken photos of collections to enable cataloging remotely. Staff have been participating in professional development, working on projects that we hadn't been able to prioritize while we were in the building, and proactively participating in projects that will enable a smooth transition once we're back in the library. Student employees have been participating in remote departmental work or are contributing to a pool of remote projects that colleagues across the libraries have created. For the first four weeks of this period, the job was primarily understanding what changes were coming or what had just been announced, checking in on how staff were doing and what they needed, communicating through Zoom meetings, website updates, email, and the adoption of new tools for our organization, like Slack. The UW in the beginning followed uh, UW medicine and public health agency guidelines. Our community is supported by one of the strongest and most advanced medical and public health systems in the world. And we were able to give our staff and students maximum flexibility to stay home if they were sick, anxious, or worried about infecting others. As our sense of urgency increased, both from the university and from state leadership, we became more restrictive in our on-site services until moving to a fully remote environment before the end of exams. I can't overstate the work that our dean and leadership team has put into messaging for our colleagues, that our communication director has put into coordinating the website and blog updates, and the willingness of many throughout the organization to engage in more, engage in more regular meetings to enable better communication, faster decision-making, and to grow a better understanding of how staff across the organization are doing. One of the first things that our dean did was to establish a COVID-19 task force of staff members across the library responsible for different services. This group met in person once before people began working remotely and then has met weekly through Zoom since then. We also established a listserv to create an easy pathway for our colleagues throughout the libraries to ask questions. Due to the establishment of this task force, these questions could be quickly answered and provided a foundation for our website's frequently asked questions. Now that we're a bit more established in this way of working and stable in the state stay home, stay healthy order, we're relying much more on traditional organizational structures to communicate and make decisions. But that task force enabled a much faster approach that was necessary in those initial days. Today, it feels like we've passed through that adrenaline driven and high stakes phase and we're now operating in a more stable remote environment. It's not easy though. We know that colleagues are juggling a lot in their personal lives and are trying to figure out how to operate in this environment. And we're continuing to remind each other of the importance of flexibility and kindness with each other and with ourselves. Thanks so much, Lauren. <clears throat> now I'm gonna turn over to uh, Bobby and Ashley, uh, who you, you don't, are working in, an, in a library itself currently, but you work with libraries, your consultants, your teachers. So I wanna ask about what's the status of your teaching and your consultancy and how have you adapted to this new environment? And let's start with Bobby. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the my office for the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is housed in the Hardin Library for the Health Sciences at the University of Iowa. 
but we are not involved in providing services um, on campus in that way. But I do want to do a shout out to our administration team at the University of Iowa Libraries. Um, I think that they've been handling this really well. We have a weekly chat session with our university librarian, John Colshaw, um, that is really great for people just to come together and share what they're doing and what we've sort of done all week and um, keep us feeling like a team. And so I've, I've really appreciated that. Um, in the GMR office, there is, I think about 10 of us, there's, there's not very many of us, and most of our work can be done remotely anyway. So we've been using Skype to, to chat while we're not in the office for, uh, gosh, going on four years now. Um, and I'm particularly impressed with our interim assist, associate director, Derek Johnson, who is leading the office with a real sense of compassion right now that I that a lot of us really appreciate. As everybody knows, there's some real challenges <laughs> to shifting how we're working. Um, the things I'm seeing as far as a change in teaching and training is that there's been an increase in demand for those things right now. Um, like many of you, I have heard that there are people who can work from home as long as there is work to be do done. Um, that includes taking webinars and training. Personally, I've been working really hard to get some new last minute webinars set up directly in response um, to the COVID-19 crisis. Our webinars are usually planned out um, months in advance. And so I've got three um, scheduled before the end of the month that I'm really proud of. And I think too, like many of you, I've seen a definite increase in my email. Um, so that has been an, a new challenge to add into the way things are going. Uh, but I think I think that, that sums it up. Thanks, Bobby. And Ashley? Hi, this is Ashley. And I have been a school librarian for many years and now work in a more consultant role. And to speak to that, many of our professional developments um, for educators in person have been canceled. And like Bobby, I have also seen an increase in email requests, especially to host webinars or to video record and film some tutorials for educators and for school librarians. Right now, many of our schools, if not most or all of our schools, are closed. Here in Arkansas, we closed the week of March 16th, which was the week before our spring break. And um, during that time, the governor extended our closure time um, to an additional week. And then on April 6th, announced that we would continue distance learning through the remainder of the school year. So the closure of the schools also meant closure of libraries as well. And many schools um, have actually been working with distance education and remote learning in an online environment. Um, school librarians at this time are providing support for faculty, staff, and even students sharing and curating resources for educators, teaching online in either standalone sessions, special events, or pop-in lessons. And um, we're also leading webinars and creating tutorials and providing a place for our faculty and staff to go for social and emotional support and a social space and continued connections, which is very important for our students right now and um, to have that space just to connect and to be together, even if it is just virtually, so that we can make sure our um, emotional support of our students is still up. We've been able to connect with um, public libraries and organizations, publishers have um, been very gracious in providing support for our libraries to allow um, learning through virtual books, ebook and even providing some audio books in a space where we can listen to authors read their own books on Instagram. And I'm really impressed with the way that our communities for all styles and types of libraries have come together during this time to support our students. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thanks for that um, discussion. And boy, it's been wonderful to see all of the chat comments of everybody weighing in what's happening at your end. If you have questions for the panelists, you can also post them to chat. We're going to we're going to pause for some questions in just a little bit. Um, but first, we would like to go to another uh, poll question. So let's move to that. <clears throat> and this 
um, question is, is a multiple choice, um, but we ask you to limit uh, to select up to three of the following services that your, um, your library or agency is currently providing to your user community. And if you want to um, elaborate on what those services are, you can post that into chat. And we are um, limited to the 700 responses. So if you hit that uh, wall, then just know that that's what's happened. So it looks like extending online renewal is, is definitely a big, um, yeah, a big one. And uh, still processing new library cards online or phone, adding additional virtual programming and expanding it or virtual help. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, and then the Wi-Fi issue. You don't have, well, less than zero, maybe one person <laughs> delivering collection items to patrons. Yeah, but, but some curbside pickup. Cool, and yep, and we see the responses coming in over chat also. Great. So any question, I'm sorry, I know I kind of, <laughs> the chat is blasting by because I said you can comment about the, the panel, but uh, let's see if there were any questions. Anybody, did you catch any, JP? There was a question I saw about how people are dealing with cataloging remotely, which is an excellent question. <laughs> cataloging new materials. <laughs> Does any uh, one of our um, panelists have any response to that? This is Kendra Jones. Uh, we actually don't have a lot of our staff who are doing catalog cataloging working right now, but those that are, are mostly focusing on digital materials and we're not really cataloging a whole lot of new stuff. So anything that has already been delivered to our library, um, our collection services director has been um, going into the library periodically to receive those and to do a very small amount of cataloging, but basically all physical materials are like frozen for the moment. So we just, we don't have a place to send them. So we're not ordering anything. Uh, our selectors are building carts, but we aren't really cataloging anything. And this is Lauren, I can speak up for the university um, perspective. We've had some colleagues uh, who before they left campus took photos to capture some content to at least get started on some cataloging of physical materials in the building, but also we have shifted a lot of our energy to e-resources as well. That's great. Um, and there was another question from a participant that for Ashley specifically, which is how you connected with publishers. Yes, this is Ashley, and I believe most of the connection happened via social media as we began to transition to online um, teaching, and many schools realized that we would not be able to get books into the hands of our students. So on social media, many librarians began posting and asking um, about copyright and what was allowed and what was not allowed in a digital learning environment especially for read aloud or story time. And publishers responded by adapting some of their copyright policies to allow um, for a temporary altered policy for educators to be able to read aloud a story or a book from specified publishers um, that is on a closed platform, such as um, Google Classroom or Canvas, where students have to log into their school account in order to access the material. So they're not posted, generally not supposed to be posted publicly. And if they are, they are only to be posted for a short amount of time. Each publisher is a little bit different. And there is a um, article from School Library Journal that um, chronicles some of this information. And I can pop that link. It looks like it's already into the chat over there. Um, 
that kind of tells a little bit about how the publishers have adapted. Each publisher is a little bit different and includes Simon and Schuster, Harper Collins, Children's Book, Macmillan, um, Little Brown Young Readers, and there's a whole host of publishers that have even, in, including Disney Publishing, that have agreed to these temporary um, terms for educators. Thanks, that was really helpful and, and very serendipitous that um, someone also posted in that, uh, that School Library Journal link. So thank you so much to you both. Um, I'm getting, so, there's an interesting, I just want to highlight one comment that came in, um, which was, thank you to those public libraries expanding Wi-Fi to parking lots, removing passwords. For example, my newly remote college students appreciate it, especially in a state with broadband access concerns. Um, so I think this, these partnerships across library types are, are really uh, great to see. Um, some questions that might maybe some of our panelists have, but also other participants, and one is curiosity about the libraries that are doing curbside pickup. What has been the most difficult part about that? And I can chime in. I know I see some of other folks are asking how libraries decided not to continue with curbside pickup. And um, from what I've seen is when the different um, stay in place orders have come, libraries have often decided that that includes that sort of um, connection as well. So um, I don't know if any of the panelists have, uh, have heard other experiences with that. It might be good to hear a bit more. Yeah, Jennifer, this is Bobby. I can talk a little bit about what I've read, um, especially with libraries who maybe tried to do per, uh, curbside pickup and then canceled it. Um, they often found that patrons weren't following the directions, and so they wanted to come up and return books to the person out there, which violates the six feet rule, right? Um, they wanted to talk and have an exchange, which we understand. Um, and so the actually staff are being more exposed and the patrons are being more exposed to risk than they had initially thought. Um, <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind is that if you're doing this, it requires PPE, um, personal protective equipment, like a mask or gloves. And if right now there's a shortage of that in the healthcare community. So a lot of libraries have decided not to do that and instead um, let our healthcare professionals have access to that those items, and then I've seen libraries donating stuff that they had to local uh, healthcare places. Thanks, Bobby. There's also a question about how are how are you planning to serve users who have limited or no access to the internet. This is Kendra Jones, and I can say that as a public library, we and we're a rural public library, we actually currently do not have um, a plan for making sure that we are delivering physical materials. And that is, it's very unusual for us to say that, but it really is that we don't know enough about the safety of the materials. Uh, we don't want to put our staff or patrons at risk, and so we are really focusing on um, anything that we can do digitally, though we are looking at possibly restarting a phone service. What that looks like yet, we don't know, um, but that would be one way that we could reach people who maybe have a phone phone access but don't have uh, virtual access. Of course, they still won't have access to the materials. That may mean that we uh, redo the re up our mail out service just for patrons who are already enrolled. We wouldn't want to expand that service at this point because again, we don't really know enough about this and we just don't want to take a chance on passing the infection any more than that. So those are some of our plans so far, but beyond that, we are just being very cautious. Thanks, Kendra. Another question is, um, speaking of cautious, what type of protective measures for staff are you planning to enact once you reopen? For example, masks for staff and requiring patrons to wear masks or other, other protections. This is Kendra Jones again. We 
that's going to depend on supply. Like Bobby said, we really do not want to take any supply from those people who actually really need that. So our plan so far for reopening, and we don't actually have a, a totally fleshed out plan. We anticipate that the stay at home order could be extended here in Washington. So we are kind of making a plan for what happens if we can't actually reopen our buildings. If we do, um, the thought right now is that it would be very limited um, access for patrons, so possibly only holds pickup, maybe allowing one computer with a 15-minute station, and it's got to be wiped down, you know, in between patrons. It's going to be really, really slow service, and any patron, any staff who are doing those those services, that frontline service, would absolutely have gloves, masks, anything that we could do. But again, if we can't provide those to our staff, then we would not put them in that situation. This is Lauren at the University of Washington, and I, um, it's hard to know exactly what the answer is going to be for us right now because we rely so much on what the local medical community is saying and state government and what we're hearing from our university administration. So I would anticipate that we'll do, plan for a variety of scenarios um, and adapt in light of whatever that current information is. I also am assuming that rather than opening the doors and being open for business on a given day, that we'll do sort of a slow open the way we did sort of a slow closure and uh, slowly bring people back into the building um, to the extent that we can safely. And that would include being open to patrons to the extent that we can be safely as well. And this is Kendra Jones again. I would echo that again uh, with the public libraries. We will also do a very slow open because the last thing we want, especially with schools being out, is, is you know people rushing to the public library and suddenly we are overwhelmed with people and we have large gatherings and that's not something that's great for uh, this time. So definitely a slow open will happen for us too. Thank you. Um, and maybe we have just a moment for one more question before we move to the next section, but if Naomi asks, uh, we have had mixed ideas about the National Emergency Library. Can someone please comment on the copyright challenges and pros and cons for this? And I'm sorry if this is some much bigger question <laughs> than a minute asked for. This is Lauren. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we certainly pushed the news when it first came out. Um, but as we've talked to faculty about their course reserves and content that they need for classes, we're trying to remind them that it's not necessarily a stable set of resources, that if an author or publisher asks for something to be pulled, it might not be there. Um, it's always challenging to know how well that communication is being heard and whether we need, how much we need to reinforce it. But we are pointing people to it with that caveat. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to um, our next question. Let's see, the long-term impl implications. So um, what do you see as the long-term implications for library services, staffing, and your community? In, um, in, sorry, uh, let's see, what are, you do, what are you doing now to plan for the long term? And I would like to start this one with Ashley Cooksley. Ashley? Yes, yeah, so this is Ashley, and I can't speak to staffing um, because most school libraries are staffed through administration, not through a, um, you know, as a director of a library. School libraries are often only staffed by one person. Um, if it's a larger school library, you may find an aide or a supportive teacher. Um, but I do hope that because we are moving to distance education and we are a lot of school libraries are being called upon to um, lead for online learning and as a resource for digital tools, I hope that this opens um, administration eyes as well as um, even teachers to how difficult or how different a school library can run with a certified school librarian versus those that are um, either do not have a school library or are um, staffed by someone who may not be 
certified or trained in the library profession. We provide so much support and are a great resource to help alleviate stress on classroom teachers. I'm hopeful that this is an advocacy tool for library collaboration as well and working with your school librarian on planning and classroom lessons and activities and that we can also build a bridge to community support and even stronger partnerships with public libraries as well. Right now, public libraries can help um, by supporting school libraries and providing uh, digital book checkouts or virtual library cards for our students if available, and, and even wireless access. I know that was mentioned earlier of leaving the wireless access on, and many of our students do not have access to the internet and are relying on public Wi-Fi. The digital divide is um, great in our country, and it's making our students who are in this digital learning environment um, adapt. Many students are meeting at, um, I actually just saw a student yesterday outside McDonald's um, sitting on the sidewalk with his device, so he was able to catch up on homework. So being able to partner with our schools, and, and like it was stated earlier, right now, um, internet access is not a luxury, and it's a necessity. Amen to that. Lauren, talk about what's about this question from the university library's perspective. Sure. Um, we all know that things are going to be different on the other side of this. Our enrollments will likely change. State budgets will likely be reduced. Our endowments will see an impact. So it's impossible to know what those differences are. And I'm personally planning for the worst, hoping for the best, and anticipating something somewhere in the middle there. Beyond these external factors, I can imagine a number of internal implications. For example, the university that I work at is a tri-campus university located in three different cities. We're all much more Zoom literate now as a result of this, and I anticipate that it will be easier to have tri-campus collaborations that don't re rely on physical commuting to participate. We're also adopting new communication tools, and I'm, I'm guessing that we'll have a process when we are return to assess which tools were useful and to perhaps change our workflows if there's something that clearly benefits colleagues across libraries. I'd also guess that we'll have some collections impact as well. We're prioritizing e-content while we're remote, but I've anecdotally heard some colleagues comment mm -hmm. that they see the usefulness of this going forward. We're also thinking more about open access content and talking with it uh, uh, with faculty about using it and planning for their courses, so I can anticipate that this might enable more open access advocacy going forward. Um, I would expect that we'll have people across campus who see that remote work can be helpful some of the time and that we'll both recognize that need and find ways to support that as employers and as partners in teaching and learning. And in the libraries, we're changing the approach of some groups to more heavily emphasize remote practices. And I can imagine a return to campus may include a continued focus on remote practices that benefit our students when they study abroad or when our faculty go on sabbatical or those that elect to continue some level of remote work in the future. At my institution, we've seen uh, the incredibly positive impact of strong and regular communication at all levels. I think that leadership will continue to provide intentional communication even once we return to the normal. And I would expect that our staff would be more likely to reach out to our communication director as we've established clear pathways to do so during this process. And finally, I'm hopeful that a long-term implication will be that we all continue to extend flexibility and kindness to our colleagues. We are getting a rare glimpse at all that people are juggling as they go through this experience. And many of these challenges continue to exist when we work on site, we just don't see them. So I'm hopeful that we will continue to recognize the full experience of each colleague and be generous in our work uh, with each other going forward. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Kendra Jones, we're going to talk about this question from Timberland Regional Library's perspective. Sure. So I know that certainly budget will be something that we'll have to deal with in the long term, but being funded by property taxes, it's actually going to be a little while before we know what that will look like. Uh, so we're certainly talking about it, but not making any plans at, at this point. Um, I saw some questions in the chat about SLP, so I do want to address that. That was part of what I was going to talk about anyway, because that is sort of long term, although it's a little future long term. Um, so we are already planning no in no in-person programming, no meeting room reservations, nothing that would cause any kind of a gathering through the end of June. And I will anticipate that that will be 
extended. For summer library program, there is there are no summer library program performances happening in person. So everything has to be virtual or it doesn't happen. We will have uh, book prizes still available for those who do participate through Beanstack. I see a lot of people in the chat talking about Beanstack. We use that as well. And anybody who participates and is still looking for that prize, we will have our usual book prizes that they can collect once we reopen and have that available. And they'll probably be collecting prizes into the fall, I would anticipate. So that's a little bit about what we're doing for SLP. Our awesome district manager for youth services actually designed an entire um, contingency plan for our summer library program. And I'm sure she'd be happy to share that with folks if they're interested in that. Um, so you can always contact me outside of this. So the other things that I think will be long-term are certainly that, that Wi-Fi. We will might look at ways to get more of the internet um, out to other places besides just our library. That's something that I know has been discussed at, at the state level and I'm sure we'll be involved in that somehow. I think our, line, our online services are going to continue to be more and more used. We'll be really focusing efforts on um, bolstering those even more. We already have issued more than 900 library cards, online library cards just since we started this March 13th. And that's pretty amazing. We also have our school e-card system called MyTRL, and we've got about 15 school districts already signed on to do that. And that basically allows all students access to our online databases. I can see that being expanded also um, probably pretty quickly as we anticipate that the next school year is going to be a lot of online learning as well. So some of those things I can definitely see happening, just our, our partnerships being deepened even more as far as internal, I have been really excited about all of the virtual communication that we've been doing. I've heard from some of my library managers that they were a little nervous about different things and now they that they've sort of been forced to, you know, try and connect and do those things. They realize it's not as scary as they thought and I think it's made for really amazing and robust communication across our district. Being very rural and spread out across five counties communication has always been a challenge for us. And I think that if there's one good thing to say about this crisis, it has really brought us together in the way that we communicate with each other. And I think we've formed some really great um, relationships and new communication styles. So that's a positive long-term um, impact for sure. Some of the other negatives though are gonna be like our houseless folks, how we are going to uh, continue to provide services to them, being that we don't have that physical space. We're looking at, I know, our senior population, things like that, that I think they may be negatively impacted by a lack of library services. And I'm not sure yet what we're gonna do about that. I'm in, enjoying some of the comments actually, because there are some ideas I think we might steal. So that's basically, I think, it for, for me. Thanks, Kendra. And I'll just interject this quick question from one participant, which is what is happening with mobile services at uh, public libraries? Right now, we aren't doing any mobile services, of course, because we have a, a stay-at-home order. If the stay-at-home order is listed, mobile services could certainly be something, well, it actually is definitely something on our list that we are exploring. We don't have any answers yet for how that might happen, and we don't have an actual mobile services department so I know that we'll be looking a lot to our peers north of us in King County and, and Seattle who have more robust um, you know, bookmobile systems in place to see what they're gonna do and we may copy some of that. I know that's something that's being thought of. The issues that with mobile services and, and other outreach are that oftentimes, even if you're pulling up to a place and you have something where you're only gonna help one person at a time, there's gonna be a big group that gathers and, and it's hard to manage that especially that we, since we're not all, I mean, we do some amount of bouncing, you know, in public libraries, but we're not, you know, bouncers. That's not what we do. We, we aren't really um, skilled in making sure that people follow the rules or enforce things um, that way all the time. So I think that's something that we're going to have to get through as some talking points for people if we do outreach again. Great. Thank you. Um, and then now, Bobby, question to you. You're talking, we cannot hear you. How about now? There you are. Yeah, I, I was double muted. Um, <laughs> uh, so since I'm not in a library providing direct service, but instead um, 
I spend a lot of time looking at what different libraries are doing. I want to talk a little bit about sort of big picture stuff. And I think the 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 first thing I want to talk about is um, mental trauma. And as our patrons start to come back into our libraries to think about um, what they may have have experienced during this time. Um, separation anxiety might be an issue both for children and parents or um, children and caregivers who have been um, spending weeks um, with all their time with each other. I know it seems like um, everybody's ready for that to end, but I think we're going to learn that we have some long lasting impacts from that. Um, uh, just being outside and being around other people, um, being in proximity to other people could be a real issue. And so I think obviously there are healthcare professionals of which I am not one, but there are going to be a lot of people talking about this um, in the coming weeks and months. And I think it's really important that we pay attention because it may means we have to change how we're um, offering programs and services and things like that to accommodate some of the, the new anxieties and, and um, mental struggles we might develop as, a, as, as people, as human beings. Um, I think, too, the other part of that is we need to be prepared for the mental trauma that library staff are, are experiencing. And, you know, I've read through a lot of the chats, both on YouTube and here, about what libraries are currently doing um, and where they're at. But I know um, some library staff and some systems have been reassigned to different types of work that they did not want to be doing and don't feel safe doing. Um, but they feel like they have no choice because obviously they need a job and insurance. Um, we have people who are, um, while, while the library might be closed to the public, they're being forced to come into the building to work and don't feel safe doing that, that, um, that they don't have PPE or, and, that, and if they do, that they shouldn't be using it because it should be going to our healthcare professionals that the buildings aren't being cleaned the way they should be, that the other staff members are too close to them, um, six feet, those kind of things. Um, and so that ties into also that many of them feel like they're um, being required to work in unsafe conditions, whether that's coming into the building like I just mentioned. Um, there are also people whose libraries have opted to do curbside pickup. Um, and I talked a little bit earlier about um, the ways in which that doesn't always work out the way you think, and that um, there's just a lot we don't know about how the virus is spread. And so, um, you know, maybe touching that trunk after somebody else did isn't the best um, best plan. And so, we have staff who have been forced into um, working in unsafe conditions, and I think that's going to have a long uh, time, long time consequences and fallout both for the systems that did it and the people um, that, that are working there, whether they decide to move on. Um, I think the flip side of that is the vocational awe that we have also been seeing happen from, from our peers and our colleagues. And I, sh I apologize, I should have grabbed the link um, to the vocational awe post on library, uh, in the library with the lead pipe. Um, but um, it's really important that we don't allow our vocational awe now to to pull us into um, doing something that, while we feel is deeply important, for example, making sure people have books, um, that, that the most important, this is unprecedented, that the most important thing that we can do right now is to stay home, stay safe, and encourage our people to stay home and, and stay safe. And I see a lot of people um, really get, um, I think, sidelined by this vocational all idea. Um, the other thing is those of us who are able to work remotely um, have had some um, good experiences. Mine personally, I think um, I mentioned my direct supervisor has been very understanding, but I've also seen a lot of posts um, from both managers and people um, that detail pretty um, extensive micromanaging of people who are working remotely, uh, including things like expecting somebody to be at the computer from eight to five um, to write a detailed list of what they're working on. You know, not only are we all um, working in new, many of us working in new and unique conditions at home, maybe maybe hunched over a laptop at a table it really isn't something you should be um, doing for eight hours a day, but you might have challenges like family members in your house and that kind of thing. But I think also um, the idea that 
there's so much going on right now, and, and it's hard to stop checking the news cycle. Um, that even if those of us who are trying to be productive um, sometimes aren't. So I think that we're going to see a lot of long-term fallout in our profession from this, um, both at, possibly as, as libraries being a desirable place to work, and you know, and maybe some more of that. So um, I think we need to be prepared for mental trauma from our our staff as well. Um, and then I think the other big picture thing we're going to see is the importance of the library as a community cornerstone. Um, we all heard about we we've all been talking about internet access and, and access to computers. Um, you know, in addition to providing Wi-Fi, often people the libraries where people go when they they need to file for unemployment and get help with things like that or apply for jobs. And and most libraries aren't open right now to allow that to happen. And so I think it's going to highlight um, the importance of libraries and an importance in the ways that we lead in the community. Um, and I think that's something also we should be prepared for. So, you know, yes, we closed our doors and sent staff home because that was the best and safest thing to do. And we led by example by encouraging people not to come out to pick up books and those kind of things. Okay, so now that we're all back out, how how do we regroup and relook at the library as a community co cornerstone? Um, and I, I think everybody that spoke before me talked about the way they think services are going to change. And I think all of those things are really important and I agree with them. Um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Um, yeah, really great to get that high level perspective. And we are going to have a, a another round robin in a little bit that is going to really focus uh, more on that staff side of the issue, but really think, thank you for bringing up um, these really important considerations around um, staff mental health and well-being and the, and how that relates to vocational awe, um, all really important as we um, grapple with this. And there have been some questions coming in uh, from the various audiences around what are we, what are libraries doing in planning for the budgeting and advocacy in this situation? Um, we have uh, um, that's which is could be a whole I think town hall unto itself. Um, you're welcome to weigh in on that one in the chat. Um, but I think I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about what. Uh, what we've been doing here at OCLC Research, um, you know, both the Research Library Partnership and Web Junction have always done things in the virtual environment. We're pretty comfortable with it. We're experienced. But even with that be said, still, things are, are extremely different for all of us. Um, so we wanted just to highlight uh, things that we have for you and your colleagues um, during this time and how we're um, and what we have coming in the pipeline. So first I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel Frick, who's Executive Director of Research Library Partnership. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks to the panelists. It's been a really great conversation. I've been really um, mesmerized by the chat, and thank you everyone for sharing. As Sharon said, I'm the Executive Director of the Research Library Partnership, and for some of you that might not know us, we're a transnational network of academic and research libraries so supported by a combination of our partnership dues and in co-investment from OCLC. And our work supports mainly academic and research libraries as they evolve to meet today's challenges, providing them with connections, knowledge, and resources to plan with confidence. This work is shaped and influenced by our partners and grounded by our research activities here at OCLC. So, our primary focus for our research library partnership activities are around research support, unique distinct and distinctive collections, resource sharing, and next generation metadata. And we look at these activities by learning together. As we learn together, um, this is, I like to say, our RLP process. And what I like about the way we learn together, and I think it's a very powerful element of our program, through our live participatory webinars and our small group discussions, via our interest groups and collaborative research activities, we not only learn together, but we're able to tap the tacit knowledge and the wide range of expertise present in our partner network. And when we do this, we sh yield a shared understanding and a common vocabulary around key issues. 
And we believe that this common view helps increase adoption of good practice, creates better overall performance, and catalyzes innovation in our community. When we actively learn together, we are not only increasing our understanding, but the process itself builds, I think, um, trusted collegial relationships. So in my mind, the RLP is not just a learning network, it is also a trust network. And it was this aspect of the trust network that has really shown through um, over the course of the events of the past few weeks. A really great example of that is in our group called SHARES, or our resource sharing network. Early in March, our program officer, Dennis Massey, began convening this group together about twice a week online, and we had um, robust participation for over a course of three weeks to share ideas, resources, and protocols as the demand for resource sharing services, concerns over staff, staff safety, and basically just the uh, expectations about the changing work were rapidly in flux. It was really amazing to see this network in action and how they just kind of were there to support each other and help support each other, not just in their work, but as people. And Dennis talks about this event that he learned here on our Hanging Together blog post. Our other standing interest groups, like our metadata managers and our research support interest groups, are also taking time out from their regular programs just to hold space and connect with our partners about how COVID-19 is affecting their work and changing their perspectives. For example, we hear a lot about how libraries are supporting the continuity of teaching and learning, but how are we supporting the continuity of research? The Research Support Interest Group is convening partner discussions right now on that topic, and we'll be sharing out about that soon. But we are also continuing our regularly scheduled programming, as we've heard and we've seen in chat. Um, there's a demand for professional development. And although our live webinars are for current RLP partners, we have a wide variety of recorded webinars that are open to anyone located at the link that you see here. Click it one more slide forward, Kendra, I'm sorry. Here we go, sorry. Here's just a couple of topics that we've had, and uh, we actually have a nice series around audiovisual ma materials uh, led by our program officer, Ch uh, Chayla Weber. So I really encourage you to go to the link you see there for our upcoming and past webinars. And if you can pop to the next slide, that'd be great. Because we are aware that there's lots of professional development resources out there, we are working to cur curate a discrete list of online learning material around our most recent research publications. You can see them listed here to help guide you and so you don't feel overwhelmed by an endless list of choices. Um, we currently have webinars and reports in a discussion guide associated with our Realities of Research Data Management series, and we will be releasing discussion guides to accompany the other reports you see here on the slide. Our thinking behind these discussion guides is that we can help individuals dig into the research independently, but also to help managers facilitate discussions with their teams and help foster a team dynamic which is extremely challenging now that we're working separately, but together. I noticed in the chat, people are trying to identify things to do. Um, these discussions guides, I hope can help. We were calling them book clubs in a way, but help to dig into our research. But before my time is up, I really wanted to thank our partners in the Research Library Partnership who have continued to support our work by contributing to our discussion groups and attending our online webinars. And also our RLP program officers, I work with a dynamic group of talented individuals who have really stepped up in the past couple of days. I'm sure just like your colleagues in our libraries across the country and around the globe, um, that stepped up to the challenge of checking in and holding space for our network to connect, not only as colleagues, but as humans, which sometimes maybe is just as important as everything else. So with that, if you have any questions or want to reach out, you can always email us at oclcresearch at oclc.org, or you can find us online or on Twitter. So with that, I'm going to hand the ball and the microphone over to my colleague, Kendra Morgan. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here today. 
My name is Kendra Morgan, and I am a senior program manager here with Web Junction. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about how Web Junction can help to support you in your professional development interests uh, and needs. So we know that many people are turning to online learning right now, which is why we wanted to share news about our Web Junction program. Web Junction is something that you can all take advantage of, and it's accessible 24-7. Uh, Web Junction is a program of OCLC research, and it is free and welcome to all libraries to use, uh, regardless of size, type, or location. And in addition to being supported by OCLC, Web Junction also receives cooperative support with, uh, from 27 state library agencies to help make continuing education freely accessible. So we really like to think of Web Junction as the learning place for libraries, and it's been our tagline for a long time. Um, and at the core of the work is providing access to an online learning network, which includes free professional development, as well as our efforts um, and initiatives to scale learning and innovation for the field. So when we design projects, um, we're always mindful of how we can make as much of the content freely and broadly available to support the library community. And I'll share a couple of examples of what those projects look like. So for starters, um, to access Web Junction, you can go to the URL, which is just www.webjunction.org. Uh, we update stories on our website every week with new content, a lot of it coming from practitioners in the field. We also produce two live webinars each month, uh, which spotlight emerging issues and new library innovations. Uh, we sometimes feature specialized subject matter experts from outside the field. But again, we really try to have library staff presenters to ground the material in real life experiences. Um, rounding out the rest of our core offerings are the regularly published articles I mentioned, news and downloadable resources, and we also have a newsletter called Crossroads that we send out electronically twice a month. And we invite stories and resources from libraries as a way to spotlight success and spread that success to more libraries who can learn from experiences and adapt them for their own community. We make sure to highlight on challenges that people saw and how they overcame those so that we can all learn um, from those experiences and help strengthen our services to the community. I mentioned earlier that um, one of the things that we do is to scale learning and innovation. And in support of that, we often run large-scale national projects, very often with the support of external grant funding. And this is all designed to help build the skill and knowledge of library staff. So one example is Project Compass, which was offered in conjunction with the 2008 recession, and it was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And that helped library staff look at and navigate issues connected to patron needs around filing for unemployment and job seeking, as well as acknowledging the toll that work took on library staff, supporting patrons through their needs. And we have seen some of that surfacing already with the COVID-19 outbreak and the challenge that Bobby was referencing around mental health and the challenges that library staff feel um, one of the terms that came up a lot when we were working on Project Compass was the importance of acknowledging compassion fatigue um, in, in jobs where you're working with the public who may be under stress themselves. We've also had projects focused on supporting healthy communities, such as public libraries respond to the opioid crisis with their communities. And we're currently running a project called Improving Access to Civil Legal Justice Through Public Libraries in partnership with the Legal Services Corporation. The key thing for any of these projects that we run is that the material becomes freely available for library staff to reuse and repurpose. They often have free webinars, resources that you can download, and we encourage you to explore the site so that you can learn more. So in terms of the professional development and continuing education for library staff that you can access on Web Junction, um, you'll find more than 320 topics in the Web Junction course catalog um, connected to everything from library management, advocacy, technology, interpersonal skills. Um, you'll note that during Skip's welcome message, he said that we have seen more than a 500% increase in use in the Web Junction course catalog 
in just a month um, as people have increasingly sought out online learning opportunities. So this is what you'll see when you go to the Web Junction course catalog. It's just learn.webjunction.org, which you can also get to from the main site. And again, it's free access anytime, anywhere. Uh, you can create a free account and get started. And we thought we'd do a quick poll. So if you go to the pollev.com slash OCLC, we're curious to know how much professional, professional development you have been engaging in during the pandemic. And this is important to note that there is no right or wrong answer. I can honestly say that mine right now is less than usual. We've had a ton of really important work that we've needed to address, um, but it's fantastic to see that a lot of you have been taking advantage of some of the online learning resources that are available and spending time doing professional development. Um, and we hope that you'll turn to Web Junction as one of those sources going forward. This is an example of a self-paced course that's in the Web Junction course catalog. Um, this is uh, one of our most popular courses, which is extreme customer service every time. And when you complete the course, you get a certificate of completion that you can use for continuing education credits. If your organization accepts them, you'll always want to check with them first. And you'll take some time, explore the different courses, the webinar recordings. Like I said, there's a big variety of topics available um, to help meet a variety of needs. And you can stay informed with Crossroads, uh, which is our newsletter. We'll post the link so that you can get signed up um, to receive updates about uh, what's happening, our new webinars and new content. Um, and you can also follow us on social media. We um, really appreciate the work that we get to do and the library staff that help us bring their stories to a broader community, and we're always looking for ways to help share those stories. So you can also reach out to us at any time if you want to share your story. All right, so I'll turn it back over to Sharon. Thanks, Kendra. Um, let, I'll just also um, mention a couple things that have been in the, in the chat, which is, yes, this event is being recorded and will be shared. Uh, yes, the chat will also be archived and shared. And yes, the links that you all have been sharing and that we've been sharing in chat will be harvested and shared as well. So sharing is the word of the day. Um, and we just have, uh, I thought I'd take a couple questions that might have come up since then, and I'll pull one up from earlier, because it's sort of related to this, you know, we're talking about things that we're doing to fill up your days um, as you're working from home, but uh, we had a question who, who actually gave the scenario of, um, we're under a statewide stay-at-home order, we do not have technology for all staff to use at home and several do not have access to the internet. Staff are being paid uh, for regular scheduled hours. So what are things that they could be doing during their telecommute time or their work from home time? So this is kind of a crowdsourced um, question for those who want to add to that. And the other thing that comment that I'd like to make is thank you again for all the, the both the questions and the comments that you have put into chat for anything that we might not be able to get to today. This is informing future programming that Web Junction and Research Library Partnership and um, other parts of OCLC will look at how we might support um, working around those questions. And I'm just looking at, I'm sorry, I'm sort of mesmerized by the chat uh, as well. <laughs> okay. Mr. Jones, I just thought I'd mm -hmm. add to that question. Um, I saw that somebody else did as well. You know, at Temperland, we actually just decided that those barriers might mean that some staff are not able to do telework and that that has to be okay right now. This is an unprecedented time. We're not looking to make sure that staff are getting you know, their 40 hours, 30 hours, whatever, in to the minute. Um, we only have exempt staff assigned to teleworking right now, and we have told them, you know, do as much as you're able. If, if they're not able to do any more, then the bare minimum is just to check in once per day that they're normally scheduled. But beyond that, 
we trust that they will do whatever they can they can do and that might include some virtual programming um, those kinds of things that are coming up in the chat thank you any other comments to that question or general topic from the panelists this is Lauren. I'll just follow up that we've been trying to be extremely flexible as well with what counts as work from home and how to do so depending on what technology people have access to. So we've had a wide variety of practices from people who really are throwing themselves into work because that's something that they can control and makes them get through this very well and serve our patrons. We have other folks who might not be able to or might not have the tools who are being encouraged to think very flexibly. So we have things like book clubs where if people don't have a way to connect remotely, they can call in or report back later. Um, we're encouraging different types of professional development that don't require technology as well as coming up with alternative types of projects. But the underlying, underlying message is to be extremely flexible, recognize everyone's situation is unique. That's a great segue, Lauren, into our next around Robin panel question. And this is around the topic of self-care, um, which is, well, I should say a, a mantra that we have at work is take care of yourself and each other. So this is really a question on both of those levels. So you might be um, in a position to be so supporting staff or just being a supportive colleague, as well as your own self-care. So um, starting with Bobby, who kind of kicked us off a little bit earlier, how uh, are you supporting staff and encouraging self-care? So I think the biggest, a couple of big things that are to focus on are um, to get some exposure to nature every day. So I'd encourage everyone to get away from their computer, up from their desk, um, to get outside, take a walk or, um, you know, get about, uh, try to get some exposure to bird song or you know the trees maybe starting to put to put buds on them if you're in the midwest like me um and getting that sunlight and that fresh air i think we don't realize how much of that sometimes we just get passively going in and out of buildings etc during our day and trying to get uh yes forest bathing uh-huh excellent yeah if you can safely do that definitely um recommend that that can make a big difference getting that vitamin d that kind of thing um, and, and taking some time. What, one of the things we've been doing in my office is um, stepping away sort of in the middle of the day to do something that is not necessarily work-related. I uh, have one colleague who's been um, repairing an old bicycle. Um, I just take the, the dog for an extra long walk. Um, you know, those kind of things um, to just give ourselves some space. And I think um, that's the really, the, the, that's important, which kind of leads into my second part, which is um, trying to, um, practice compassion for yourself and for others. So um, I really recommend um, mindfulness if you have not explored that. Um, I actually took an eight-week course on it with the university last summer, and I, I was a little skeptical going in, so um, I understand that if anybody else is feeling that. But I have found that it really has um, helped me in the last, I don't know, nine months since I did that. Um, there's There are some really great videos, free free YouTube videos on that. There's uh, there's a lot of apps out there too that people, um, I don't use one, so I don't have any recommendations for those, um, those kind of things. But um, part of that self-compassion too, I think is, is if you're if you're not feeling productive, if you're not getting everything done that you think you need to be doing, um, if you're not training for a marathon, if you're not <laughs> um, inventing gravity, you know, it's okay to not be doing any of those things. It's also okay to be spending all of your time playing video games or cooking um, excessive <laughs> amounts of baking, which is some of the, some of the things that are happening in my house. Um, sewing masks, that's that's something I've been doing as well. Um, and then compassion for, for others, I think is important that, that um, we all might be responding to this a little bit differently. Uh, and to remember that um, <clears throat> maybe anger and frustration aren't directed at you and you're not the cause of it um, or people might be a little slow to respond to email or you know those kind of things and try to remember that we're um, sort of all struggling right now so uh, that would be it for me I think I see great things in the chat too <laughs> thanks Bobby 
Ashley, is there anything else that you would um, add to what Bobby offered? Um, absolutely. Bobby mentioned a couple of um, self-care apps, which I use as well, um, that have free courses that you can do and for meditation um, and mindfulness. Um, one of them is Headspace and the other is Calm, and I'll add those into the chat as well. And both of those are completely free to educators, so you can unlock all levels if you are an educator. The Yoga with Adrian YouTube channel is fantastic as well. I am in the middle of becoming a certified yoga instructor, so I try to connect daily. I've made it sort of just a personal um, goal of mine to connect with um, at least four friends each week just to message and check in to see how they're doing we have a weekly trivia, a social distancing trivia on YouTube um, hosted by a friend, which is fantastic, and anyone can join that. So it's just kind of a great way to have a break, as well as making sure that we um, encourage connections and have a fun time with faculty and staff in the education world. And um, right now, I know many people are um, very stressed. And just having a time where you can meet together just for fun, even if it's happy hour or just to check in. Um, Tracy Chen from Vancouver, Washington checks in with her faculty once a week as a school librarian. They meet as, and um, she's kind of put a twist on it where it is themed. So last week they dressed up for um, Tiger King theme and this week was the Netflix show Ships Creek. So not only just kind of meeting in to see each other but also continuing to have some of that fun time where you can um, just provide a space for people to come and have a good time. And I will share the link to the virtual trivia in the chat as well as the apps that I mentioned. Thanks, Ashley. Kendra Jones, do you have any ad ad additional ideas? Um, sure, this is Kendra. So obviously, yes, we share, you know, gifts, funny videos, those kinds of fun things. But honestly, I have, you know, close, like 250 to 300 staff across my district. So doing a, encouraging self-care has been a little bit um, different. And since half of our staff are not um, currently actively on work assignments, that is a little tricky as well. So what we've been doing is really focusing on the self-care part by making sure that staff don't have to worry about their jobs. So we want to make sure that they can take care of themselves in whatever way they do that. And that is by making them feel secure in their employment because we do know that they all have different um, issues and, and, and things that are happening in their lives, mm -hmm. including um, childcare since our schools are all closed. So that's been the main thing is just to let them take the time. So if they need to do that self-care in the middle of the day, that's great. We're not asking them to track their time. They aren't assigned to be at work at any, any given time. Um, the other part is really encouraging each other when somebody does need a break or says, hey, I'm going to go for a walk, they don't have to tell us that, but maybe they mention that, then everybody celebrates that to say, yes, great, you know, take care of yourself, enjoy the sunshine, those kinds of things. We also have been doing lots more virtual meetings so that people can connect. Some of those are voluntary, and they're more like coffee chats just to say hello to each other, see each other's faces. Everybody misses each other a lot. And we recently had an almost all of our teleworking staff joined for a virtual meeting and we did a coworker show and tell so people could show off their pets. Uh, so little things like that are mostly what we've been doing to support staff and encourage self-care. We haven't been, you know, giving them the things with the, the yoga suggestions, things like that. We're really letting staff um, identify what they need to do themselves and just celebrating anything that they are doing. Thanks, Kendra. And, and Lauren? Thank you. Um, I'm a big believer that in times of change, it's important to meet more regularly. And I'm also a big believer that when you can't physically see each other, it's critical to intentionally reach out more virtually. So uh, in this environment, I'm, I really think the job is communication, to have regular meetings, um, uh, mostly to check in and make sure people are doing okay, but also to communicate whatever the changes are, to engage in informal spaces that develop at Slack or Microsoft Teams or whatever you're using. Um, and my institution, we're uh, doing a lot with email messages to the broadest team. Our dean is sending daily messages. I'm sending semi-regular ones to my portfolio. Um, and we're also all actively sharing information for the website and blog updates. 
I also think a lot about affective communication and being transparent about what I'm experiencing as a working parent or when I was going through my illness during this time period to help build a sense that we're all going through this together, both in figuring out what remote work looks like for our given situation, but also in navigating our regular life at the same time. I also regularly mention that we can't expect normal levels of productivity in this moment. We all know that, but I think that sometimes it helps to hear that articulated by someone else. And given my role, I can help legitimate that belief and understanding. So from where I sit in my role and at my institution, it's mostly been about communicating, being transparent, and acknowledging that we all need that flexibility and kindness towards each other as well as ourselves. Oh, really great suggestions. And, and there's been so many chat about this as well. Um, let's see, I think we've got a minute, a couple minutes for some final questions. And one question that came in, I think it was from YouTube, is uh, any thoughts what um, unique needs that international students might have and what initiatives libraries can take to provide support to them? This is Lauren again. Um, I think that there are a number of uh, challenges unique to that situation, depending on where someone is. Um, if the professor is planning synchronous uh, class sessions, that might put the class session at a time of day that one would normally be sleeping, depending on where they're coming from. Uh, copyright law varies, and we found that the cost of some resources that faculty are assigning their students might be pretty inexpensive here, but very expensive for students are. So uh, in our communication with faculty, we're trying to communicate those things that we've noticed might be um, extra challenging and sort of help faculty think through it, but also working with colleagues across campus who are in faculty support roles to help communicate those types of issues. Any other thoughts from those who might be working with um, students, international students? or library users. OK, great. So um, here's a question. Uh, we talked about self-care, also all sorts of wonderful ideas for that. Today is a Monday. We have another <laughs> week ahead of us. Um, and so we always like to have everybody think about before they leave the webinar room, um, what's one thing they can do? So my question to you is what's one thing you can do for yourself this week? So, and I, you can put again your answer in chat and I'll just do kind of a lightning round of our, of all of our panelists, including Kendra Morgan, Rachel. So let's start with uh, Lauren. What's one thing that you'll do for yourself this week? Um, as I work in the main room of my house with my child sharing the kitchen table, uh, I have been giving myself permission to not do super house cleaning, housekeeping, but do a little bit of neatening up just to feel better in the workspace. And then my general self-care is to try not to create a big list. I, I have that tendency to want to accomplish a lot, but uh, to recognize that maybe now is not the time for that mega list. <laughs> Yes. Well, I should mention um, this is this is Sharon. Is maybe I'm answering that the previous question too is um, one of the things to that I'm trying to do with our staff is that we leave our overachiever nature um, behind for a while um, and just uh, take it take a, a steady pace. Um, so thank you for modeling that with our with list making. Ashley, what about you? So this week, I, I am a list maker as well, and I consciously made a choice yesterday to make my list a little bit shorter than I normally do so that I can ensure I am spending time outside every day just to breathe in some fresh air and not be cooped up inside my house sitting at my desk all day long and to spend Time. I set some alarms on my phone so that I, I could remember to get up and stretch and take some breaks and bought myself some really nice tea so that I could have a hot cup of tea um, and just take regular breaks and, and not, again, like you said, um, trying to leave that overachiever self um, somewhere else. Thanks, Ashley. Bobby? 
think I'm going to try to incorporate um, more exercise earlier in the day. Uh, a lot of times by the time I get to the end of the workday, I'm pretty exhausted between the things I'm trying to do and sitting at the computer. Um, and I, I don't feel motivated necessarily to, to either do some yoga or go on a very long walk, but I think um, maybe that will become a lunchtime exercise for me. Yeah, I always know it's a danger zone when my body feels like it's in the shape of a chair from sitting in it for way too long. Kendra Jones, what about you? You know, uh, my work, probably I enjoy it a little bit too much, so it is a little bit like self-care. I think I would have been panicking if we had not been allowed to work during this time because I do really love it. Um, but don't be like me. Um, I actually really thrive on helping, you know, seeing what I can do to contribute to things. So I'm working on making some masks this week, and that's going to feel really good to, to be uh, physically productive with something as well as doing some baking and uh, also some playing video games. And even though it's not very healthy for me, I'll probably be drinking some beer for some self-care today or this week, not today. Thanks, Kendra. Well, I think we've just hit about the bottom of the hour, which is hitting the end of the um, of our time together. Boy, that just flew by. So this was a fantastic. We really um, appreciate all your feedback. As you leave the room, you will be presented with a, a survey that we would really appreciate that you could fill out. I know you gotten a lot of surveys over this past month, but you can chop that up to one of your um, one of your activities this week, something you can check off your list. So fill out that survey. We do really value that feedback. And um, that and then as I said, this recording will be posted as soon as available and we'll be putting out some other distillations and uh, from this event. So thank you again. Thank you to our panelists today. We've uh, really appreciated your perspectives and I wish you all a safe and healthy and self-caring week.